Gentlemen, if you'll find your seats, we'll start our panel Q&A. My name is Austin Duncan. I'll be in charge of the Qs, and the As will be provided by these gentlemen on stage. Uh, we sang, I love thy church, O God, and the theme of the conference this year is the church, and it's appropriate. It's, I think, going to be instructive for all of us. When we sang those lyrics and heard the sermon we just heard, uh, I think the question to start with is, where did you learn, men, your love for the church? There's plenty of people who would say they love Jesus, but they don't love the church. They've had bad experiences with the church. Where did you learn your love for the church? Where did that happen in your Christian life? My mama and daddy. Uh, my mother was the choir director at the church. My father was an elder. Uh, we were always the last people to leave church, uh, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Uh, church, my, I, 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 I've had the privilege, I've never been in a church that didn't have a Bible-believing pastor um, who was preaching the gospel uh, from the scriptures. And so my testimony is to God's faithfulness to me through faithful preaching ministry and through a faithful biblical congregation from the time I was a very, very small child. My story is very similar. And I'm born to Christian parents, raised in a Christian home, church, so much a part of life I didn't know life was possible without it. And, uh, and, and genuinely wholesome, wonderful experiences. So I loved the church even before I was a Christian. But as a Christian, I came to love the church in an entirely different way. Uh, where once we recognize this is the bride of Christ, then our love for the church, especially as preachers and as ministers, just grows over time. And I will simply say right now, I think my love for the church is made all the more dramatic in my life by the context in which the distinction between the church and the world is being made so unavoidably visible. And uh, so... My, my love for the church is such that I have no idea who I am without the church, and as a believer without the church, as my primary identity, as I am in Christ, I am of Christ's church. Austin, did you grow up in a Christian home? Yeah. Okay, well, so unlike you brothers, I grew up in a nominal home, so I didn't lo learn to love the church from that. I think I saw a faithful pastor when I was a, when I was a young person, and I think that helped a lot. Uh, and the other thing is, I guess I would say, honestly, I loved the Lord. I'm not sure I really came to love the church until I was pastoring the church. I think, I, I think it was after I was at CHBC, it was in my first couple of expositional series, and then dealing with the individuals that I think then I much more self-consciously began to, as you put it, love the church. I'm going to correct you, my dear brother. <laughs> I, know oh, your heart. First. I know your heart better than you know your heart in this. <laughs> Uh, I dare say, how's that? Uh, because I saw in even the years you were in Cambridge, in letters that filled two drawers, very precious to me now, when we were writing each other two or three times a week, I saw so much of your interest shift from what you might say was a parachurch evangelical world to the love for the local church during those years. And I think I could document it with textual criticism. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, I'm sure that some of that's true, too. Yeah, but, th but there was certainly, I just, for you guys who are pastors here, I just, I'm aware then I'll say that my love for the church grew a lot as a pastor of a local church, because I have a lot of real opinions on the church right now. I have a lot of things that I think are true and I think are important, and, and I don't think I was so full of that before I was a pastor. I think it was working with a local church that made me care more for the local church. Yeah, I, I think I understand all of that. I, I... Um, that's been my experience too. <clears throat> I, I loved my grandfather and he was a pastor. So because I, I just adored him, loved him and saw such warmth and virtue in him, um, that's how I felt about the church. And then my father was a pastor and, and it was the same thing. My, my father was the same thing at home. He was in the pulpit. There was never any question about personal integrity in his life. He loved the church. He loved the Word of God. He loved preaching and teaching in the church. I, just, I grew up with these men who were the models of Christianity in my life 
who had a complete love for the church and were devoted to the church. So what I saw grounded me in that affection, but it wasn't until I became a pastor of a church that that transferred from the idea of the church to the people in the church. And then you begin to realize the only way I'm going to last here is to love these people. And you just start cultivating it. And you sort of will to love past the challenges of this, of this congregation that doesn't know you when you first arrive. Well, I love the way you brought up in your message that the pastor loves the sanctification of his people. That's it. I mean, that's, just, that's, that's, that's the experience, I'm sure, of, right. of every pastor here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you feel the pain um, in their sins and their failures and their weakness. Uh, that, that is, and, and I think from my standpoint, that's why I've never left here, because I, I don't think that I could just walk away from this group, and I know you feel that way as well, and say, I'm going to go try another batch. And it doesn't to say that everybody has to do what we've done, right. but I mean, you're, you're, you're there for life. That's the sense that I get, because you're involved in seeing these people become what God wants them to become, and in raising up people out of that congregation to do the very same thing. Um, I think that, that that perspective is more likely to keep a man in a church than any other. How do we instill that same affection for the body in new believers? Uh, obviously, you were influenced by your families and uh, by your pastorate, Mark, but when we're discipling new believers or we encounter those who love Jesus but not the church, how do, how do we help them understand uh, the priority of the local church. Well, honestly, this is one of the things I'm thinking about for uh, the Together for the Gospel conference coming up because I'm going to talk on uh, how the local church makes a difference in our sanctification, really just kind of what you were teeing off today. Um, and I haven't figured out how I'm going to do it yet, but I want to try to help pastors think very practically about how we can teach in our local church the Christians to understand how the local church is supposed to help them be distinct from the world. So I think we just have to get very particular, kind of like John was beginning to do today with uh, Galatians and the rest of the New Testament, uh, <laughs> about, about, about the sanctification that the Lord wants in His people. It, as pastors, one really important thing to do is to stress to parents that parents often think there's somebody else more influential than me in the forming of this understanding of the gospel, embrace of Christ, and love of the church, and that there's some other place more strategic than the local church that will impress that upon their children. And they're wrong about both of those things. So as pastors, if you can empower your parents to realize there is no more basic discipleship unit in the church than them, and they are far more powerful than any youth director or anybody else that will ever be in their children's lives, and that the local church is where they are meant to be shaped, not somewhere else. And there are thousands and thousands of godly, Bible-believing parents that they don't realize that, and they need to be encouraged and empowered by their pastors to realize the strategic influence that they have. Dr. Moller, you recently wrote about the importance of the presence of children in corporate worship services. Talk a little bit about how that instills what we're talking about here. Yes, I want to get to that. If I can begin by saying, uh, just to echo off of this, that uh, Michael Walzer famously, at least famously in my world, uh, argued about the distinction between thick and thin theories of justice. I know that's what you came to think about this <laughs> afternoon. But the difference is, is that the thick theory is comprehensive. The thin theory is just something you might reference in passing. And his point is, without thick justice, you don't have justice. Well, translate that to ecclesiology. The distinction between thin and thick church. If thin church is something you come to, then it's not going to be all that meaningful in your Christian life. But if thick church is what you are of, if that's where your identity is, and, and, and that's where you know Christian flourishing and uh, to exist and Christ be honored, then in thick ecclesiology, you're going to have a thick Christian identity linked to the church. So I don't think we should expect people who go to church to think much of the church. 
people who are the church uh, will love the church. And that should include the tiniest among us. Uh, Lig and I will differ about exactly how to define this. He Presbyterian and I correct. <laughs> but uh, we, will, <laughs> we, will, we will define this similarly by making the emphatic point that children should be present among Christ's people and that they should be welcomed among Christ's people. And I don't know how much of my Christian life was forged before I became a believer. When my legs were dangling off of a pew, unable to touch the floor, and where my deacon dad, when he finished deaking, uh, you know, in the service doing those responsibilities, came and sat with his arm either around my mother or around me on this hand, to assure, on this hand, constantly there, ready to thump the back of the head if there's any wayward movement. And, and I, I mean, you just look at all that and I realize how, what a good covenant father my father was, uh, just to set me right there. And I sat through everything. And I don't know how much of the sermon I ever understood, but I will tell you, we believe that the Holy Spirit will apply the Scripture and drive it deep into little hearts. Come on, you were really like reading the bulletin or something. <laughs> you were reading. You were sitting there reading. Well, I will just simply say I would have been had I been allowed to have had anything other than the Bible. <laughs> tell, but, him, tell him the story about when you were going to quit choir. This is just a good, this is a good Christian parent account. I was in everything because I didn't, I didn't have a choice. I was just in everything in church. And that meant about 13 or 14 hours a week minimally at church. And I was in the youth choir. And when I was 15, I decided I'm not going to be in the youth choir anymore. I don't even know why, except I thought this is just sheer ego. I am me. Hear me roar. I am, I'm not going to be a part of the youth choir. So I'm, we're at Sunday dinner and I just said to my parents, eldest of four children, I just launched out and said, I've decided I'm not going to choir practice. I'm going to quit the youth choir. And my dad never got angry or anything. He just looked at me and said words I'll never forget. He looked me in the face and he said, son, you didn't join. <laughs> and uh, so it was... Uh, <laughs> Thus was born your Calvinism. That was right. <laughs> It was, uh, it was my father's own doctrine of election. And so there it was. And, and, and honestly, we need more dads and we need more moms like that who just say, son, daughter, you're not joining, you're in. Confronted by the word of God and surrounded by Christ's people in the hope and anticipation that one day that child will hear the gospel and believe and believe and be saved and grow in grace. Amen. John, what were youth groups like in the 1950s? Uh, bow ties and trumpets. Uh, kind of YFC. Youth for Christ. Youth for Christ, yeah. And um, Bible quizzes. Sword uh, drills. Sword drills. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty much it. Uh, and that was kind of before youth culture was so distinctly defined. So we were, we were hearing the Bible, we were reading Bible stories, we were learning Bible verses, all those things that you would associate now with Awana. Well, basically, we did in junior high and high school. We hadn't substituted the, the external culture for the life of the church. You know, just one footnote to this. <clears throat> I love to see the children in this church uh, wandering all around this church. Uh, I love it after services are over to see him walk up here and run around the pulpit and the plant. I, I just love to see that. The, the, every Sunday, almost every Sunday, some of them jump in the fountain out there, and there's always somebody there who wants to get them out, and I say, leave them in. I want, I want them to feel such warmth and freedom and uh, acceptance uh, in this place that they love coming here. Uh, I, I want people to treat them with love and kindness and uh, I just think it's important for them not to feel that this is sort of stiff and austere and different and distant. Um, it, needs to be, it, it needs to be like a home to them. 
And that's one of the reasons that I think it's so important to have activities during the week for families in the church so that the church becomes the place they connect so many of their wonderful memories with outside of a worship service. So good. And a helpful word for those of us with young kids or pastors who are trying to raise their kids to, to love the church and to appreciate uh, all the blessings that come from being a part of this. Dr. MacArthur, this is going to be your 50th Easter sermon at Grace Church coming up in just a few weeks. <clears throat> you got any ideas <laughs> about how I can tell Usually the resurrection, do resurrection story for the 50th yeah. time? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would stick with the resurrection. You're, you're, <laughs> you're known for it. Uh, as you think through all these years of, of ministering in this one place and shepherding not just the church that we have here now, but the generations that have gone before them. You've, you've cared for and pastored multiple churches of generations of families who've been raised in this church. And then this morning we hear you talk about the, the burden that you have, your heart for the sanctification of these people, uh, the passion for holiness, uh, for God's flock. How do you think about, having, having pastored for so long and seen so many trends and so many difficult cases, how do you think about your desire to see Christ formed in them as well as recognizing with pastoral patience that they're in process? Well, I'm, I'm in process, so um, I'm not under any illusions. Um, I, I hear the echo of Paul's words, not as though I have attained but I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We know what that prize is. It's to be like Christ. That's the prize of the high calling. And he's pressing toward that prize, even though it's not attainable in this life. And, um, and that's why Paul says, take heed to your doctrine and your teaching. You start with your own doctrinal conviction. You start with your own life. You start um, with the realization that the patience of God is being exercised in you. Um, you know, one of the things that you have to, I think you have to overcome sort of in a consistent way, is the fact that you, you have to preach a, a better message than you can live. And, and so there's always this sense of shortcoming in your own life. And although I have, I've, had, I've seen the Spirit of God in the sanctifying work in my life take me to places that 30 years ago I never thought I'd be in, in terms of um, my faithfulness to the Lord, I'm not what I ought to be. And I have to realize that if that's true in me, that's going to be true in everybody else. And, um, and I don't think the pulpit is a place where you necessarily hang out all your dirty laundry and uh, grovel about your inadequacies in life. But, but I, I do think you deal with things in reality. And the second wave that you deal with is your own family and the people who are closest to you. And you're living a godly life in front of them, and they're not everything they should be. And the people you maybe have invested the most in aren't everything you'd want them to be. And I think you have, to, you have to exercise the patience of Christ in dealing with his own disciples through all of this, who was saying the same thing at the end of the ministry. He said at the beginning, oh, you have little faith, and where, why hasn't there been more progress here? And that's why Paul says, preach the word, but be patient. Um, and that patience is an expression of love to people. Uh, you cannot get up and preach some truth and expect that that's going to change everybody instantaneously. It's, it's, a, it's a small building block uh, that begins the process of edification, and that takes time and years. And you begin to, you begin to see the change when, when people aren't fighting anymore uh, to do the right thing. It's almost their involuntary response. The default position is to do the right thing. And where you'll see it in the life of your church is when you call for any noble cause and they rush to that noble cause. You don't have to recruit, right? Something you just said that I'd like to hear you expand on, Dr. Dever, and the rest of you as well. Uh, John, you said you have a kind of, I'm not going to use this word, authenticity when you preach, right? An awareness that you, you're a sinner too. At the same time, you're concerned about those who would flaunt their fallenness in the pulpit. Help us think about, and Dr. MacArthur, you go first here. Help us think about how to preach authentically, how to preach in that way. Uh, how do you strike that balance? 
Are people accusing you of hanging out all your dirty laundry in your sermons? No, I don't, okay. I don't think so. I, I've never done that. I don't talk about myself in my sermons. I rarely ever make any reference to myself. I'm not there to do that. But I think the people that know me and live with me all the time, like you, Austin, and so many others, you, you know me for who I am. Um, I'm very much aware that I'm dependent on you, and the more intimately people are connected to me, the more I depend on them for the integrity and the, for, and the, and the moving of the ministry. So um, it matters to me supremely that I maintain a clear conscience before the Lord, uh, that, that I know nothing against myself here, and am I not justified? The Lord knows the secrets of my heart, but that's where I have to start. And then that the people around me believe in me and believe in my integrity. Um, so those are critical things. And yet what drives me is not so much what they think of me, but what drives me is knowing that's important. Um, am I right before the Lord? And that, that's just a pursuit. That's just a, a pursuit of the heart. I don't know if that's what you're intending yeah. out of the question. But. Yeah, that's really helpful. Mark, is be yourself in preaching bad advice or good advice? Well, it's, it's necessary advice in the, in the sense that I can't hear Al speak, and I've heard Al give some tremendous sermons, and then I try to go be Al. And the, I'm, just, I'm not my brother. I love him, thankful for him, but I, I'm, I'm not him. You know, or, or Lig and John. You know, I've heard all these men preach tremendous sermons, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to do it exactly like that. So in that sense... Be yourself is crucial. You know, Phillips Brooks, truth through personality. There's, there's a lot of truth in that. That's not the most important thing about preaching. You know, and if somebody thinks that's the most important thing, then they bought into the idolatry of the kind of authenticity that you were talking about. Uh, but I, I think we have to be aware, particularly as preachers, it's not just the world who thinks there are phonies in the church. There are phonies in the church. There are phonies in ministry. And we have to be very careful not to be that. So we have to watch our own hearts. Are, are there ways, like it's true that we always have to preach better than we can live, no doubt about that, but are there ways in which we're getting a hardened conscience to our own sins? And who knows us well enough that can speak to us about that? With, with whom are we being honest enough? Are we being honest enough with ourselves? Are we spending time with the Lord and His Word each day? Are we praying for Him to investigate our hearts? So I think all of that has to start very much with the pastor personally. And there's nobody who can do that ultimately for you. These brothers, I love all these men and I'm thankful for them. And, you know, I'll get texts from them sometimes and we're together occasionally. But none of these brothers can do that for me. I, I have to be there with the Lord or else it's, it's not real. Dr. Mole, you train men to preach. Talk about how you help them think through this issue. Well, I do teach them to preach unapologetically, but more importantly, we want to teach them to pastor, in which preaching is the first most essential act and the first mark of the church. So I think a part of this is a celebrity culture that wants to point to the pulpit and say, preaching is what matters, the preacher is what matters. But it's actually the preacher as pastor as a part of the congregation. So what I'm looking for when I'm looking for authenticity and integrity, I mean authenticity here in the good New Testament sense, uh, what I'm looking for is someone who is surrounded by spiritually healthy people, not just by television cameras or by fanboys or girls or bots. Uh, because I'm looking for where's the church? Where's the church? Where's the... And, and, and as a matter of fact, so people say, uh, well, Albert Muller is president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and answerable to trustees elected by the Southern Baptist Convention. It's absolutely true and absolutely important, but far more important for my spiritual life is I'm a member of Third Avenue Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky, a part of the body of Christ, a congregation of believers where we belong to Christ together. And so I would say if the preacher is ever abstracted and preaching is abstracted from the life of the congregation and accountability to the body of Christ, then expect disaster. And so I want them to, I want them to know that. I want them to know that we, it, it, and, and that's a part of the reason why even the nouns, you know, become dangerous. If you, if you just keep using preacher, 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 and don't put it in the context of church, 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 congregation, pastor, uh, then uh, shepherd, that's a good word for us. 
Um, I want to look at the sheep for the authenticity of the shepherd. Dr. Duncan, how has shepherding the people at your church shaped your preaching? Well, along the lines of what Al just said, Ephesians 4 makes it clear that our job pastorally and our job in the pulpit is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The, the end of what we're doing is not so that people will say what great preachers we are or how authentic we are, but how well they are equipped for the work of service, how much they are formed, how much Christ is formed in them. All of these different New Testament phrases to describe the goal of pastoral ministry. So I, I, just, I think it's really important for a minister to regularly remind himself that, that that's what I'm getting up here to do. I'm not the star of the show. I'm the equipper. I, you know, the, 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 my ministry will be certified not by how many people like my preaching, but by how Christ is formed in the congregation and how they're equipped for the work of service and how they know the Word of God and these matters of sanctification that John talked about earlier. And it's, it is, it, you can be a very faithful brother and forget that. I mean, you, we, we need to really work hard to remind ourselves that in ministry. And by the way, that will beget the frustration that John was talking about. I mean, there's no way to be faithful in ministry without experiencing that frustration. Because when that becomes your goal, you will, be, you will become painfully aware that the most exalted rhetoric is not able to produce that. You will be painfully aware that you are utterly dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit. All you can do is deliver the Word of God. You may deliver it faithfully, and it may fall on deaf ears and hard hearts. And only the Spirit can, can put flesh on those bones and raise them uh, to newness of life. And so you'll have all of, the, all of those terms that John brought to your attention from Galatians about Paul's attitude towards the church. Those are going to come to mind, but it's, it's good to remind ourselves of that over and over again. Dr. MacArthur, you said that there's not enough sermons being preached that call people to holiness. What else isn't being preached? When I ask that question to, for all of you, what do you think is, is a neglected avenue or, or area or series of sermons that the men need to consider preaching on? And maybe specifically, how would you go about preaching the holiness of God, since that was the one that you brought up to us? Well, um, I think if you're an expositor, you cover it all. You cover it all. Um, I think that, that's why it's dangerous to be a topical preacher and move from place to place to place. Uh, if you're just unpacking Scripture sequentially as, as it's revealed in books, uh, you're covering all of it. You're, you're not going to leave anything out. You're, you're basically forced to do that. And it's a powerful experience for your own soul. This is what I was maybe hinting at a little bit this morning. Uh, learning to listen to the Word of God with high impact is an acquired skill. When you are sucked into a passage of Scripture and it begins to unfold and, and get weight, and it keeps getting weightier and weightier and weightier, and all of a sudden you feel the conviction, you, you feel the glory of this. The Father has glory, the Son has glory, the Spirit has glory, and the Word has glory. And when the Shekinah of the Word starts blazing into your face, this is the high level of spiritual experience for a believer. But, but you, you have to learn to listen like that. That's, that's the genius of explaining the Scripture, because every text is, a, is an argument, it's a cause, it's a divine argument for truth that leads you to a, a literally exhilarating, spiritually exhilarating conclusion. That's how preaching should be. Uh, and in, in that process, people are caught up in the glory of the Word of God, and, and they, they don't come here for anything else. That's why they, it's the same reason these men are here. They're here to hear you preach because they know that the experience has no parallel. It has no equal. I, I agree with you with the regular practice of preaching, but I do have to say, brother, listening to you this morning, that 40-minute introduction of yours to Galatians 4.19, well, I was a little bit, but I mean, I was just, I was loving it. And uh, I would say that was a very edifying, topical treatment of a theme raised in Galatians 4.19, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, this was not Sunday morning at church, 
It was a passage code. It was very different. But honestly, it was a very edifying concatenation of texts of Scripture. Well, thank you, Mark. It means a lot coming from you. It really does. And, but I would say this. Sometimes when you do that, the passage explains itself. You literally set it up, and then when you read it, everybody says, oh, I get that. That's, that's, a, that's a eureka moment. Oh, I get it. I see it. Sometimes just creating the backdrop brings it to life. Also, I'd like to see guys preaching on expositional preaching, explaining to the congregations why it's so important that they do it. Preaching on biblical theology, on a biblical understanding of the gospel, of conversion, of church membership, of church leadership, of discipleship, of church discipline. You ought to write and, a book about that. Well, I'm just saying, there are, there are a few Aren't things. Aren't there nine of those? <laughs> there are a few things that should mark our churches, and our churches don't know what they're supposed to be if we won't teach them. So part of what you have to do, brothers, I know it feels awkward, you've got to teach your job description from the Bible. They need to know what you're supposed to be doing, and they need to know what they're supposed to be doing to be a church. There was nine of those if you didn't catch them. <laughs> so. A lot more than nine. <laughs> what are you thinking about what to preach, what is neglected? Dr. Moeller, Dr. Duncan, what are you thinking? I want to affirm what Dr. MacArthur said. Just consider one book in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians. Just take that one letter from the Apostle Paul, and you've got virtually every single doctrine laid out. You have every considerable moral issue the Christian church uh, is likely to confront, and, and you've got uh, life in the Spirit together. As, uh, as, as I mean, it's just, it's just all there with about a thousand things I haven't mentioned. Uh, by both implication and explication. So expository preaching is, I think, the way to hit not only all the issues, but in biblical proportion. This is the Holy Spirit-inspired order and sequence and proportion uh, uh, to these questions. But I think it's fair to say, what are we afraid to preach uh, in this generation? And, uh, and this is where I would simply say, you have to preach the text, and then I'm going to come back to biblical theology. You have to put it in the context of other texts. You can't preach the gospel without the word only. He gave his only son. Uh, the exclusivity of the gospel is something that isn't going to be caught by intuition. It's got to be made explicit from Scripture. The solas of the Reformation— Getting close to those will never get you into trouble. The, the Reformers did not get in, into trouble for their affirmation of Scripture, of faith, of grace, of Christ. It was justification by faith alone. It was grace alone. So I, I think we have to point the arguments the way Scripture points the arguments and interpret Scripture by Scripture and the analogy of faith. And, uh, and help our people to know how to read the Bible. But you know, it, it's not enough just to say, Jesus saves. When the text would have us to make very clear, only Jesus saves. Just to make one point. And, uh, and, and in a day in which the church is rightly concerned not to preach moralism rather than the gospel, and I affirm that entirely, that does not mean that we don't preach morality, uh, even as Dr. MacArthur mentioned this morning, in personal holiness. And so we need to make certain that the gospel does not become an excuse for avoiding preaching about sin. And, uh, well, you can take it from there. Yeah, I would, I would add one thing that um, I'm going to get on this a little bit on Friday. I think we have to identify false teachers. And I think we have to identify false doctrine. Uh, what we're going to see in Galatians, if you want to get ready for Friday night's message, read the first 12 verses of chapter 5. Paul's language is shocking as he confronts false doctrine and false teachers. It's some of the most stunning language that he ever put to a pen. Uh, I don't think there's a willingness to do that in this age of tolerance and compromise. And uh, Paul says, look, I ceased not for the space of three years to warn you night and day with tears. And I knew it was going to happen. After my departure, 
evil, perverse men of your own selves would rise up among you, and from the outside wolves would come in, not sparing the flock. If you do not, this is two, two sides of this thing. The pastor's purpose we talked about this morning. Friday, we're going to talk about the pastor's protection. Protecting people is critical, and that's what Paul was doing. He, he was concerned about their sanctification, but he was also, he ends that, that emphasis in chapter 5 before he gets to walking in the Spirit, the positive side, with this amazing blast against all false doctrine and false teachers. People can easily be bewitched, and that's why I said maybe most churches are bewitched to some degree, and that's it's often because we will not be straightforward. I'm not talking about, you know, naming names all the time. I'm just saying giving them criteria to be discerning about error and, and how devastating it is. And Dr. MacArthur, you have been faithful to call out threats that you see to the church and to the gospel over the years, and we're all grateful for that. Uh, you're all students of church history and the church has been preserved and protected by uh, men who've been willing to take on those threats to those things most essential to the Christian faith. Uh, today, what do you see as looming threats? Uh, what else is out there? Without spoiling Friday night, what, what do you see now that's a threat to the church from the outside? You do recognize you asked me to preach on that tonight. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to hear you. No, I, ju I just don't want to preach my sermon before we get there, but okay. I'm happy for Dr. MacArthur to preach well, it. He's made me give mine away for Friday, so. Yeah, look, look, I can give a simple answer to cover all of it. Anything that's, anything, anything raised up against the knowledge of God, anything untrue, that's a threat. I'll name two that I see right now. Gender issues, any number of them. And... Uh, and addiction to signs, wonders, dreams, and visions. Without spoiling Dr. Moeller's message, Dr. Duncan, any thoughts? I, I see uh, we're, we're preaching into a generation, even in the churches, uh, people that are they're at church, they're in church, they're profoundly influenced by the culture and the, the, the way the world evaluates things. And they are, they are coming with a set of moral arguments against historic Christianity and, and biblical truth that many pastors are tempted to try to accommodate. Uh, rather than to confront as a, 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 a false way of, um, of understanding and an, an actual affront to biblical truth. And so we, we are going to have, and, and gender, sexuality, marriage, et cetera, as Mark just mentioned, is one of the areas where that happens. It's not the only one. Uh, you have people bringing moral arguments against the God of the Old Testament with them to church. Um, and so one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to respond to that in, in a compelling but faithful way, uh, affirming the, the truthfulness of the faith once delivered. And, um, and that means you have to know how they think and what, what has attracted them to that manner of thinking. And then, then you have to plant your feet in the scriptures and refuse to budge from them, uh, refuse to accommodate your teaching to what's popular right now. And I, f I think I feel that right now more than at any time in my life. Um, and I'm talking about in our circles. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this is, this is Bible-believing pastor world here right now. And I'm talking about the kind of people that show up in our circles. I, I feel that they are more under the uh, influence of, bewitching of, the way the world thinks about a series of these things than in any time that I can remember. Part of it probably is that evangelicalism has suffered from a lack of Bible teaching for the last 40 years. John hinted at it today. Um, 
but really with the beginning of the church growth movement, the idea was Bible expect, uh, exposition will bore people. And so if you really want to reach people and, and church the unchurch, you need to ditch Bible exposition and do, you know, sort of superficial, uh, practical talks. And as a consequence, we've ended up de-churching the church um, so that people haven't heard Bible exposition in a lot of places. And in the, in the, <laughs> into that vacuum, something else has come, and it's not Bible. And uh, so you're, you, you now have that, you know, that's now placed on your doorstep, and you're speaking into that world, and you need to be, you need to be ready to do that. You know, one thing strikes me in this. Uh, I'm convinced that to be male is to have ADHD. And uh, perhaps to be human in one sense, but especially to be male. And it's, uh, it, it's sort of like you're going, this is the most profound truth. I'm talking about human dignity. I'm talking about the gospel. I'm talking about the hypostatic union. Oh, there's a giraffe video. Um, <laughs> you know, wh where does that come from? And yet that's what I'm seeing writ large in, in some of our circles right now. I, I thought, amazingly enough, that 10 years ago, something remarkable was happening. Because what I was hearing was just about every preacher say, at least say, that what he was determined to do was biblical exposition. Almost everyone was saying, uh, I'm committed to expository preaching. But then the next thing you know is, I'm committed to expository preaching. I'm committed to verse-by-verse -verse exposition. Oh, there's a giraffe video. The signs and wonders thing is just amazing. How many people, some of the same people, who were speaking about the necessity of a word-centered ministry, uh, they are now being uh, uh, attracted by um, what detracts from the ministry of the Word, at the very least, what distracts from the ministry of the Word. And uh, I, I am shocked that it has happened so quickly. I, I think one of the things, uh, picking up on what a number of you said, particularly like something you were saying, is I certainly feel and I wonder if you brothers feel this too, that I'm tooled up against nominal Christianity. If I want to give you a knock on nine marks, I think it's kind of written in my mind in the 90s, and my big concern is, is nominal Christianity. And it, it is a big concern. But I feel like the world we're living in right now, nominal Christianity is a problem, but it's being replaced rapidly with a hostile world to Christianity. Now, I know the world theology has always been hostile. I got that. But I mean, like, America in particular and the communities that we're in, that there was a respect 15 and 20 years ago when I would go into a hospital that the nurses would give me as a Christian pastor. That is just gone now. Uh, and maybe that's just the D.C. area. You know, maybe it's different, you know, where you are. But I think that there is a, a, a theologically, there's no change that's happening. We know that ultimately. But in our experience, how, what do you think about this? That 20 years ago, a lot of us were necessarily more exercised about nominal Christianity, and that that has just been replaced in America with open hostility, the, the rise of the nuns that you talk about, the people of no religious uh, opinions. No, and no, I think that's true. I think um, we're, we're living in a culture that, if it had its way, sort of at the elite level, would make Christianity a crime. That's how far it's come. Uh, I think all these laws that are being passed all over the place are really, in, in, in the end, the end game for all of this is to make Christianity, biblical Christianity, illegal. That's what all the free speech stuff is all about. You can't say that in my presence, you know, that's offensive. I, I think there is a wholesale move in that direction. And of course, if that is going on in a time when the church is trying to be pragmatic, You've got an absolute disaster on your hands. Yeah, and, the, and the, the, the way they will do that is more sophisticated than making Christianity illegal. They will make any public consequence of Christianity illegal. Baking a cake. Right. So what you do, as New York Times columnist Frank Bruni said, in the privacy of your home, your heart, or your pews, then that's your business. But you take it outside, and uh, you're out of bounds. And so I, I think that's coming. And I think that's where we have to make very clear that Christianity is a public truth claim. We're not saying that Christianity is true for us. 
We're not saying that Jesus Christ is Lord for us. We're saying that Jesus Christ is Lord and that the gospel is true. That's what will get us in trouble. You know, um, Al, your book, and I recommend all of you guys read this book on conviction, leadership by conviction. Um, I mean, that is the issue in leadership, conviction. And what I see missing is courage, just plain old courage. The courage to stand up and speak the truth in the face of all the trends going the other way. That speak the truth in love, but where is the courage? Be a man, act like men, have some courage. Mentoring is, you, you mentioned it, the Apostle Paul, he had no earthly mentor. Uh, it's the burden of all of you men to mentor younger men, especially in ministry. Uh, talk to these pastors about how they can find a mentor. How, how can they be discipled? How can the discipler be discipled? Let me just jump in and say, uh, I understand that you, if, if you're a pastor, everybody expects that of you, and you, you, you don't necessarily have somebody in your little world all the time to do that. Um, I was with Steve Lawson last night, really interesting. He has a study with no windows, but he has four pictures hanging on the wall that are framed, and they're huge. Uh, one is um, William Tyndale, who basically was hanged by a chain and then burned to death, and then gunpowder blew his body to bits for the faithfulness of preaching the Word and printing the Word when it was against the law. Uh, he has Calvin looking over one other part of his desk. Um, he has um, John Rogers, the first Marian martyr, uh, in his Bible to remind him of the first man who was killed for the cause of the gospel under Bloody Mary. And uh, he mentioned somebody else, but he said, when I walk into my study, I just have these looming figures hanging over my head. Uh, we have the wrong heroes in this culture, for sure, for sure. You would do well to familiarize yourself with those great men who gave their lives for the cause of the gospel. It'll humiliate you, hopefully, hopefully to a point where you're broken and, and the Lord can rebuild you into a man of character and courage. You don't need, you don't need a buddy-buddy mentor. You just need to start familiarizing yourself with the great heroes of the faith through history. Though dead, they speak. Good. Dr. Dever, your thoughts on training men, on investing in men, having those kind of relationships as a pastor? You mean uh, who I look for to train me or who I look to train? Let's talk about how you think about mentoring. For me to find a mentor or for me to be a mentor? Which, whichever you'd answer, I'd be happy with at this point. Well, you start by, start by finding a dude who has on some Dr. Seuss socks. <laughs> I just can't get that out of my mind, Austin. We've, I'm sorry. It's just uh, we've covered the socks already. Wow. Um, I think you look for the hungry. You know, you look for the people who want to grow, who find profit in your ministry. Uh, you know, I'm a pastor of a church in Washington D.C., and most evangelical Christians in Washington D.C. are not members of my church. I'm not the pastor of every Christian in Washington. I'm the pastor of just the people in this church. And everybody doesn't have to benefit from my ministry. You know, just these people are benefiting from my ministry. And it's the same way when we disciple. It's just because, you know, I'm a Christian, that doesn't mean every Christian has to be able to learn from me or I have to be able to teach them. I just trust the Lord will provide enough for what I can do to try to pour myself into them. So I'm just looking for those people who are available. So very practically for me, when I'm standing at the door at the back on Sundays after preaching, I will probably say to two, three, four, five, six people, hey, call me up sometime. Uh, we'll have coffee or get lunch. Almost never does anybody do that. You know, maybe, maybe one out of every two weeks worth of people. And that's going to be the sub subgroup out of which we'll develop some continuing ongoing relationships. So I look for those people who are willing to, when I take a little bit of initiative, they're willing to pick that up. That's going to be a self-selecting group. So I think that's one thing that's helpful. Well, you men are mentors to so many of us, and we're grateful for that. Let's conclude with a quick uh, lightning round slash acknowledgement. What, what have you learned about the church from someone on this panel? Well, I'll, I'll start with the obvious. John's preaching the word expositionally for 50 years 
is a huge encouragement to me. Because my congregation will probably do something sweet. I, I don't know, but, you know, i got 25 years coming up next year. And I'm just thinking, like, that's half of what John has done. <laughs> like, I could do that again, and it would be... Now, you know, the Lord calls people to different times yeah. and different places, and yeah. that's fine. <laughs> but it's really, brother, it's a, just a huge encouragement. Amen. And, and I, I've had the privilege sitting here in a number of Sunday mornings hearing you preach just your regular expositions, and it is such an encouragement to watch your confidence, your joy, and people being fed and growing from it. So that's an obvious thing to say that I'm sure we would all agree with. So thank you, brother. Well said. That is the necessary thing to say. And so I'll, I'll say what I said to someone just an hour ago. Uh, before I ever knew I would ever know John MacArthur, he was teaching me how to preach the scriptures when I was a skinny 16-year-old across a continent, and I heard him by cassette tape. And uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's the one necessary thing that has to be said. The other necessary thing I want to say is of the friend to my right and the friend to my left, that we have been friends in the gospel for each other so close for so long, I no longer know who I am without either of them. And uh, I pray that for you in ministry. You need friends with whom you can be, by God's grace, faithful together over time, such that I really can't tell you exactly what either one of them has contributed to my life, other than so much I can't catalog. Uh, our, your thinking begins to be so mutually dependent, and your encouragement for each other and from one another is so pervasive that... Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't do anything important in life, nor would I think through any big question without talking to Mark and Lake. Wouldn't happen. And so, uh, what exactly they contributed? You be the judge. Um, but I'll, I will say what I when I talk to young pastors and I say, please, please, please develop friendships that you intend to maintain through life, in ministry, in the gospel, in the preaching of the word, in the service to Christ. I, I desperately uh, make that plea. You, you need someone who will not be offended to hear from you at three in the morning. And you need someone who will drop everything and come to you if you need it. And uh, you need someone with whom you don't have to begin a conversation. Every conversation's picking up in the, just where you left off last time. Quick example, I was early in ministry at CHBC. I had a really kind of weird job ministry opportunity. I called Al about it. I think I was a little bit excited and really uncertain what to do. Al lovingly, quickly thumped it. And, uh, and he was right. You, you want friends like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm around a lot of Presbyterian students that are excited about a, theolo a, a theoretical high ecclesiology, and I always say, if you want to see a high ecclesiology, go to Capitol Hill Baptist Church. That's where you'll see high ecclesiology. And so it's just wonderful to see a brother that has tried to work out the Bible's truth into the way a congregation lives together. And, and knowing Mark and Al, are, it's like knowing great heart and evangelist from Pilgrim's Progress. Dr. MacArthur, the final well, word is yours. But yeah, every, everything these guys have said that I've heard, everything they've written that I've read, every time I'm with them, my life is enriched. That's not quantifiable. That doesn't come in measurable bits or gigabytes or any other thing. I'm, I am what I am because of these men and the other people that God has put in my life. And um, I mean, I'm as much a Presbyterian as I'll ever be. <laughs> Because of Ligon Duncan and, and Sinclair Ferguson and R.C. Sproul. Yeah. And I... But that's just because they're so nice. It's not their theology. <laughs> no, I mean, no, it's, no, It's no. because they're so nice. It's their godliness. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Right. No, 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 don't right. worry, Mark. I'm okay. not going there. All right. I'm not going there. <laughs> but I'm only trying to, make, trying to make a point that we are, I don't know, like Al said, we are what we are because of these relationships. And... They're not quantifiable. There's something in my heart jumps when I know you're going to be here, you know, when I'm going to be with you. To preach in Capitol, to, uh, several times that I've preached there have been highlights of my life. 
because it tells me that you trust me with your people and I know how you feel about your church. You don't put it in the hands of anybody, just anybody. And I, I, I'm honored by that, even if I have to sit in the upper room for two hours after Sunday night. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> That's an inside story. But it's, it's a wonderful, delightful thing to do because it's part of how, how he trains his men. Um, yeah, every, every time I'm with these men, I, I am enriched. It's just another, another deposit by the Spirit of God through them in my life. Christ comes to me through you. We're so grateful for you men, for your ministries, for your influence. Uh, on behalf of all of these guys in attendance, uh, thank you for spending this hour with us talking through these things.